Hello everyone and welcome to this new Road to 2200 video in which I will go through a game I've played with a high instructional value and explain my thought process to you. For today's video, everyone that either plays the French or plays the exchange French against it will be blessed with a way for black to create a lot of imbalances in the game. This could really help spice up your games when you face e takes d5 on move 3, so sit back, relax and enjoy this fascinating game. Let's dive right into it. As you will probably know, the French defense starts after e4, e6, and usually they play the move d4, after which the French player plays d5, trying to fight for the center as well. And right now there's a lot of things that white can do, for example the advanced French, the classical French, the rush variation, but also, actually the boring one is e takes d5, and after e takes d5, we both lose our e pawns, and the d pawns are staring at each other in the middle of the board. And what usually happens here is that people try to copy each other and create a very symmetrical position. And whenever this happens, we don't like our games. It's just boring, there's nothing to do. And also it's so symmetrical that it probably in a classical game will always turn out to be a draw. At least if the players are of equal strength, of course. In the game, what happened is the opponent played the move bishop to d3, after which I copy him on this move, but after the move knight to f3, I play the move bishop to g4. And lines with bishop to g4 always get very complicated and very tricky. My opponent decided to castle. And after castling, what we are going to do is place our knights on e7 and c6. And right now I play the move knight c6 first. And you might be thinking, well, what if they check us on e1? Well, then we can just block with the knight and there's nothing going on. The opponent didn't check me on e1 though. He played the move c3, which is theory still. And after knight to e7, they played the move h3. And h3, it tries to invite us to take the knight and after the queen takes back, well, he's just activating his pieces and we don't want that. We want to remove the bishop and put, place it on the h5 square. Right now it's still pinning and if he wants to play g4, we're gonna say, all right, do it. Because it's not really worth it for him. We haven't castled short yet, so we can always castle long. And after that he has a very weak uh, king side, so he's not gonna do that. What he did instead was play the move bishop to g5, which is also not really accurate, because after this I can just play the move f6 for free, and the bishop just gets attacked once again, and he helps me start up my kingside advance. We want to push our pawns on the kingside at some point, and playing the move f6 helps with that. Uh, after which he played the move bishop to h4, and bishop to h4 is just fine, you actually want to place it on g3 later. But what happens, our bishop is already on d6, so when he moves back to uh, g3, we can just take, and after he takes back, they have double pawns on the king side, and this diagonal becomes open, which could be advantageous for us in a later stage. What happened right now is I play the move queen to d7, actually preparing to castle long. But what you have to look out for in these kinds of positions it is that whenever the opponent plays queen to c2 and threatens to play bishop to f5, you have to be careful that this knight stays on e7, because if it moves away, for example, to g6, the a uh, bishop can just come here and after we castle, pin our queen to the king. So that will be really disastrous. Uh, what happened in this position, he played the move knight b to d2, which is just developing his knight, and after which I castle. And this is the end of the opening. Now in these kinds of middle games where we castle on opposing sides, what actually happens is that we try to push our pawns on the king side, try to attack this king on the king side, and he will try to play moves like b4, b5, trying to attack my queen side and after that create an attack as well. So it's going to be very double-edged and you ha really have to calculate through a lot of variations, which is really nice because then we as the better player, of course, can win our games. Well, what happens first is he played the move queen to c2, threatening to play the move bishop f4, of uh, f5 at some point, but we're just not going to move this e7 knight. What we did instead is play the move bishop to g6, and right now you might think, well, they can just take and double our structure. But we really don't mind because our rook is on the h file and it's attacking this hook on h3. And whenever the pawn on h3 is forward, there is going to be opportunities to sacrifice a piece on it and then create a mating attack on the king. So he didn't do that, but instead he played the move bishop to g3. And this was what he was planning all along because he's just staring at a, a pawn on f6. Now he wants to trade off my good bishop, and in exchange for that, he doubles his pawn on the g-file. After this, 
I get to attack this right away by playing the move knight to f5 myself. And right now there is no threat of pinning my queen to the king because we can just take back with the bishop and attack the queen. Uh, what we are threatening though is taking this pawn on g3 after which we attack the, uh, the rook and we just take a free pawn. And if they don't do anything about it and allow for us to play the move knight to e3, then we fork the queen and the rook and then we just go up and exchange, which would, be, which would be advantageous for us. Now what happened at this stage, he just took the knight because he didn't see a, a different way to not lose a pawn. And after this, I take back with the bishop and he plays the move queen to a4, trying to really attack me on the, uh, on the queen side, playing the move b4, b5 afterwards. And that's what his plan is going to be. But what I decided in this position, which may not be correct, and um, it, it's more practical than objectively accurate. I played the move bishop takes h3, and the computer thinks this is a blunder, and I don't completely disagree with him. But what does happen is it offers me practical chances, because after he takes, and I take with the queen, he has to play the move king to f2, and you really don't want to play this move. This just, it doesn't look safe for your king. Yes, you got a piece in, in exchange for two pawns, but it's very critical two pawns that defend the king. Now, I thought I was able to start a kingside attack after this by playing the move h5. And he played the move rook f to h1. And f to h1, it just attacks my queen, so it has to move. Now I decided to pin this knight to the king. And he immediately wanted to escape the spin by playing the move king to g2. And after king to g2, there's a lot of things that I can do. But I just try to keep pushing and just try to put as much pressure on his position as possible. After this, he decided to play the move, move rook a to f1, attacking my queen. So that whenever he moves his knight somewhere, I don't know where, he would attack my queen and after that I would have to move. Uh, there's no real threats of discoveries because if he takes my pawn here, I can just take back with the queen and I'm not attacked by the rook anymore. So there's not really much going on, so I don't have to move my queen immediately. What I did play is the move h4, trying to take the pawn away and make the king even more naked on the king side. Now, after this, after playing the move h4, he decides to play the move knight to e5, which I did see, but didn't think it was too dangerous. Because now I could just play the move queen to e6. And after this, he took my knight. And if I would take back right now, we would have this check on a6, which was really annoying. And I really felt like I had to do something immediately. And I decided to play the move h3 check. Right now, if he would take with the rook, I would take back with the queen, checking the king. And if he moved, I would just be able to take back the knight. So he can take it. And he decided to move back to g1. After moving back to g1, I had a check on e3. And he can't really uh, defend this pawn anymore. Because when he plays the move rook to f2, I pick up the pawn. And now it's three pawns for one piece that wasn't really critical in the position. If you take a look, I have three pawns ready to try to push forward and promote. Which is really uh, uncomfortable for him. And he in the end made some mistakes which made me possible to push my pawns far, far enough to get an advantage. Right now I don't have really that many checks, I only have this check on d3 and I was thinking of repeating at this point because well I do have to take back this knight at some point and then I really destroy my queen side and he would be able to penetrate it with his queen. What does happen is that when I take back, he takes back, I can play the move king to b8 and surprisingly, I'm quite okay in that position. I did decide to repeat once though. And after he moved back to g1, I decided to take the knight. And after that, he took with his queen. And now I almost have to play the move king to b8. And surprisingly, I cover this square and these squares are not really weak. So I'm pretty safe at this point. What he decided to do is play the move a4. And right now he wants to exchange those queens because if he gets to play the move queen to b5 check and we exchange queens, the piece that I gave for three pawns becomes a bigger issue because then these three pawns would be able to be taken by the rook, for example, and he would just take the advantage and then win the game afterwards. So I couldn't let him do that. 
I had to do something else. And I decided to play the move queen to g3 once. And I just wanted to repeat one time. And after he moved back, I played the move queen to g3 again. But then in the end, when he moved to as king to f1, I thought, you know what? I'm not really scared of this move. I can just play the move rook to d6, attacking the queen. And whenever he checks me, I'll just move my rook in front. And when he takes on d5, I can take on b2. And I have another attacker ready to put some pressure on the position. Now, after this move, he decided to play the move queen to f3, really putting some more pressure on my queen. I decided to exchange queens and after he takes with the knight, this becomes a really complicated endgame and let's see where this takes us. Now when we start this endgame I have to, a couple of principles in my head that I don't need, have to forget. Because whenever I exchange rooks for example, there are less pieces on the board and the less pieces there are on the board, the less valuable these three pawns become. Even though they connect the past pawns, he is going to be able to defend it with his king whenever I exchange too many pieces. So instead of that I play the move rook to b1 check and he has to block with the knight because if he doesn't I'm just able to capture this rook on h1 in the next turn. What I want to do is solidify this pawn and give the pawn an extra body to keep pushing, pushing, pushing and then check the king and the rook for example. So after g4 which is a great move I just keep the pawns rolling, he will have to sacrifice a piece at some point and then I would be able to convert that position. After g4, there is a couple of things that he could do. He couldn't, for example, take the pawn on f6, because after that I would play g3, and he almost has to sacrifice his rook at this point. Now, whenever he plays king to g2, I'm just able to play the move rook to h8, afterwards defending the pawn, and this knight is still hanging, so he'd have to move it first. Then I could play rook to g8, and I'm just equal in pawns. And I'm up at exchange, so this would be a, a win for me if I play it correctly. Now, what did happen, he didn't take on f6, but he decided to play a move that was a little better, and he decided to play the move rook to h2. Now, rook to h2, it threatens one thing, that is to move this rook to the b2 square and trade off my rooks. And I was pretty scared of this, and I didn't know how to actually get an advantage out of it until I saw the move g3. And after g3... What actually happens after rook to b2 is I could have played, I didn't do it, I could have played the move king to c8. After king to c8, these pawns are going to be able to win it against the rook that I just sacrificed. Because after I play king c8 and then this move, I would be able to play g takes h2 and there's no way for the king to come close to these pawns. And also the knight is blocking it, so the rook can't defend anyway. So in this position I would just be won. But Instead of that, I played the move rook takes, and after rook takes, I, I played king c2. And this is just a worse version of, of this variation. After this, he can play the move king to g1, which he did. And this becomes really difficult, because whenever I push a pawn, he can just step behind it. And there's no way for me to make any progress in that position. What I could do instead, though, is take the open file, the e-file, attacking the knight simultaneously. But right now, he should have played the move knight to d3. And that would have been just fine for him. I would be moving to the e3 square, but he could just defend his knight with the rook. And this would just be equal. He wouldn't be able to make any progress, and so would I. Um, these pawns are just going to stay right, right here. And I can't push my f-pawn, because whenever I move, move it to f4, he gets to take it with the knight, and then I'm even worse. So he, instead of that, what he did do is play the move knight to f3. And the key difference between this is that when I play the move rook to e3, he can defend the knight with his rook because it would be able to be taken by the pawn on g3. Now, he can't move back because after that I would take the knight and just checkmate the king, which is a big threat over here. And he's just not able to defend this knight. What he could do is play the move knight to h2. And if I would take, he would just be able to take back and that would be an equal position. So I never do that. But instead of that, I just gave a check on the back line. And after knight on to f1 blocking it, I could play the move h2 check. And to whatever square the king moves to, he went to g2. I can sacrifice my rook for the knight. And if he takes, h1 equals queen. And whenever he moves to this line, I'm just able to check him and capture the rook. 
So I was really happy to make this into a win. And you can really see the power of these connected, pa connected pass pawns against a piece. In the end game, it usually is an advantage for the one with the three pawns if they're connected and pushed far enough. But in this case, he just wasn't able to defend it. And I, I get to take back a win. And as you can see, my ELO is now about 2050. So I'm one fourth of the way to my goal to 2200. I'm really happy I was able to win this. And in the next couple of games, I hope to be climbing even more. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this end game very instructive. You will now be able to play an imbalanced game against the exchange French and not just draw the games against white. So thank you all for watching. Leave a like and subscribe if you like this kind of content. I hope to see you guys soon. Bye bye. bye.